You know, if you think about it, what was it? Just a month ago or so, we began the new year. And none of us know the very specifics of what's going to happen in this coming year. We know what has been predicted, what will come. But we often don't know the dates and the time frame. For example, none of us know when the rapture is going to happen. We know it will. We just don't know when. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, on such and such a date, Jesus is coming back. So we don't know the specifics, but no matter what takes place, we need to consider how God guides us even through adverse circumstances. How God guides us even through some pretty rough roads. Perhaps I should give this message a title. I, I, over the years, did not give too many titles to my messages, but if I were to give a title to this message tonight, I would call it, From Evil to Good. And I'm thinking of a particular verse in the Bible. It's found in the book of Genesis, and I invite you to turn there to Genesis chapter 50, the last chapter in the first book of the Bible. Last chapter. And this is the end summary of the life of Joseph. This is the final conclusion when he meets with his brothers. And notice how he words it in verse 20. Genesis 50, 20. Uh, and most of you are probably familiar with this verse, I'm sure. But as for you, Joseph says to his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God. Did you see that? But God. You want to do a fascinating study in Scripture sometimes, just take those two words, but God, and trace them through the Bible. But God meant it for good. Notice, from evil to good. In order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Here we have uh, the end of the story of Joseph's plight. Now I know from a couple passages in Genesis how long his trials took. We find in, and you don't need to turn to this particular passage, but from, Gen from Genesis 41 verse 46, we find that at this point, when he is second in command in all of the land of Egypt, he's 30 years old. 3-0. Okay? But he began in chapter 37 and verse 2, he began when he was 17 years of age. He's watching his flocks out there with his brothers and everything else. He's 17 at that time. Now let's do quick modern math. 30 minus 17 equals the last I figured about 13 years. And in this time of 13 years, Joseph undergoes some very severe trials. I'm not going to mention all of his trials tonight, but I'd like to look at three major ones. In chapter 37, and we'll need to turn back just a few pages in our Bibles, we have the first trial, and that's the trial of enslavement. Joseph is going to be sold into slavery. Chapter 37. And the basic cause why he ended up in slavery was because his brothers hated him. Imagine that. Sweet family, right? But his brothers hated him. Now, we are told at least three reasons for this hatred, right in the text. The first one is found in verses 1 and 2. Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. That's Jacob. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph being how old? 17, right? Remember 17 and 30, right? 13 years. 
He was 17 years old. He was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah, the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Hey, Dad, my brother's out there. You ought to know what they're doing. Now, nowhere in the text does it say what the battle report was. We have no clue. It may have been true. It may have been not so true. We don't know what he said. All we know is this was the first reason for their hatred towards him. I call it pessimism, a bad report. Wait, there's more. Now, the second reason for their hatred towards him was preference. He got preferential treatment. Look at verses 3 and 4. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Uh-oh. Did you get that? He loved him more than the other because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Well, can you blame them? I mean, guess what? Here are these guys. Eleven brothers so far, right? And dad, he makes him a nice coat of many colors. And I don't know what Joseph did at this point, whether he kind of put it on and just walked by his brothers. Hey, guys, straight from J.C. Penney's, you know what I mean? I don't know what he said. I got one and you didn't. Or he may have not said anything and his brothers are saying, how does this guy rate? Man, fancy coat of many colors, and us, we belong to the same dad. You can just imagine. You know, when our kids were growing up, we tried not to show favoritism. Now, they, there was a three and a half year age difference between our two daughters. So you wouldn't necessarily buy them the same gift at Christmas. Okay, but what you try to do is uh, the, the same amount, the same value, something like that. Not in this case here. First you have pessimism, now you have preference, and on top of that you may have a little bit of pride. Look at verses 5 through 8. Now Joseph had a dream. This guy was a dreamer. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. Bad enough. He's bringing a bad report. Bad enough. He's got this coat. Now he's dreaming. What's he dreaming? So he said to them, please, hear this dream which I've dreamed. And I'm thinking the brothers are scratching their head. We can hardly wait. There we were binding sheaves in the field. I used to do stuff like that. Help our farmers bale hay. I'm telling you, that's a tough job. So they were binding sheaves. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around. And guess what they did? And bowed down to my sheaf. Get it? Now, they're not that stupid, guys. They know exactly what he's saying. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Is that what you're saying? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Pessimism, preference, and possibly pride. He was either pride or he was naive. I don't know which it was. Perhaps both. We find three reasons for this hatred, but we also find three results of this hatred. He's in for trouble. Look at verse 18. The first result is conspiracy in verse 18. Now when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they did what? 
they conspired against him to do what to him? They're going to kill him. Enough's enough, right? We've had it with this guy. This dreamer. This one who's preferred by his dad. We don't need that in our lives. So they conspired to kill him. Conspiracy. In verse 27, commerce. You know what? We'll get rid of him. But uh, here is a you know, caravan of Midianites, Ishmaelites. And why don't we do something with that? Verse 27, come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother. That's Judah saying this in verse 26. And our flesh and his brothers listened. So what we're going to do, instead of killing him, conspiracy, we're going to sell him. Commerce. And the third result is a cover-up. Verse 31. So they took Joseph's tunic, this wonderful little coat of many colors, they killed a kid of the goats and dipped the tunic in the blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Notice, they don't say what happened. They put it in the form of a question mark. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? Do you know? Well, you you're the one that wove it together. <laughs> His dad certainly had to know. So you have conspiracy, commerce, and cover up. Let me put it in different words for you. Kill him, sell him, and lie about him. Nice brothers. Just imagine the severity of the test when your own family is against you and some of you may well know what I'm speaking about when your own family is against you I don't think we get in this passage what really happened to him on the way to Egypt because that's where he's going but the Psalms tell us what happened to him if you will turn in your Bibles to Psalm 105 I came across this, I, I was reading the scriptures, and I, all of a sudden I said to myself, this is not in Genesis, but it is in Psalm 105, and it's part of the story. Listen to what happens to him. You talk about the trial of enslavement. Look at Psalm 105, verses 17 and 18. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Notice the next verse. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. Folks, this wasn't a pleasure tour on Greyhound to West Virginia. I will tell you, he was in chains. He was in fetters. He was in irons. He was probably bleeding as they dragged him to Egypt. This was not a fun trip. The first major trial in Joseph's life was that of enslavement. But we're just beginning this 13-year story. And by the way, when I use the word story, I'm not talking about a fable, a fairy tale. This is an actual, factual, historical event in time and space. It really happened. The second trial was that of enticement. First, there was enslavement. Now, in chapter 39, you have enticement. He finally is brought to Egypt. And he lives in Potiphar's house. Potiphar was a servant to Pharaoh. And by the way... Pharaoh and Potiphar are terms of, not names, but terms of offices. You, you understand the difference? The man's name was not Pharaoh. The man's name was not Potiphar. That was their title. Like a farmer or like a vice regent or like ambassador or something like that, okay? 
So he's brought to this house in chapter 39, and the lady of the house is really not a lady. She's anything but a lady. Uh, she was after Joseph in a very bad way. Look at chapter 39 and verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife, that's Potiphar's wife, cast longing eyes on Joseph. Now he was living in that complex. And she cast eyes on him and she said, notice carefully, lie with me. She was a lady of the street. That's what she was, except she was part of his wife. Now, that's the first time, verse 12. That she caught him by his garment, since he wouldn't submit to her. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. But guess what he does? He left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Now that's quite a test, if I may say so. It's a test where he is severely tested because he is living there. And now this woman has her eyes on him, and she wants him to do what is immoral. That's what she's trying to get him to do. This was a severe trial which found Joseph faithful in spite of the fact that he was falsely accused and ended up in prison. Verses 13 through 20. Let's look at verses 13 through 20. Here's what happens. So it was when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she didn't get away in other words, that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them saying, See, he has brought in to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. Liar is right. I couldn't have said it any better. One word describes it all. And it happened when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me, and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Evidence. Got it? Evidence? Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to me to mock me. He's making fun of us here as a servant in our home. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. What's that word again? Liar. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. He was mad. Then Joseph's master took him and put him into prison. He was just enslaved, wasn't he? Guess where he's gone? Back in the tank. A place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. Folks, a prison in those days didn't have satellite television. It didn't have a library. It didn't have three square meals a day. It was a pit. It was the pits. And fortunate if that man would have gotten one meal a day or water in the hot sun. Fortunate. You talk about trial. I'm wondering by now what Joseph's thinking. What do you think Joseph might be thinking? It doesn't say. But I'd be thinking, Lord, what, wait, let's see. What am I doing here? How did this happen to me? I mean, Job, remember Job? Job said something like this. I wish I'd never been born. Trial number one, enslavement. Now he's in with this woman who's trying to get him and he's running for his life. He's now in prison because he won't do what she wants him to do. Enticement. But there's a phrase in this passage I want you to see. It happens three times in this chapter. You've got to see it. Are you ready? Verse 2. The Lord... 
was with Joseph. Did you get that? I want you to see it again. Look at verse 21. He's in prison. But the Lord, what? Was with Joseph. Did you see it? We're not done. Verse 23. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. We're still not done. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 7. This is reflecting on the historical record. And in Acts chapter 7, you'll see these words in verse 9. Acts 7, 9. This is how a person survives trials. You understand? This is how he survives. Chapter 7, verse 9 in Acts. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. What are the next few words? But God was with him. You like those words? Yeah, I do. They're there for a reason. They're there for me. They're there for you. Yeah. Third trial. The trial of encounter with his brothers. Now, there was another trial or two between that. Chapter 40 is in prison. These two guys, the butcher and the baker. There was no candlestick maker, by the way. They're just butcher and baker. And one's going to live and the other's going to die. Right? And uh, the butcher gets to live. The baker gets to die because of the dreams they had. And he interprets it for him. He says, you're going to hang and you're going to let be let go. You, you can have your job back. But remember me, okay, when you get out. And guess what the butcher did? Forgot. In the meantime, Pharaoh has a dream. And suddenly this butcher guy remembers, hey, I know somebody can help you with the dreams. You got a dream and this guy, he helped me with my dream. He can help you get him out of jail and hey, bring him over here, I'll tell you. I'm paraphrasing. I'm trying to put in a few minutes what we have in several chapters here. So, he interprets the dream for Pharaoh and basically he says to him, seven good years are coming up, you'll have plenty of food. Seven bad years are coming up. Famine. And to make a long story short, Pharaoh says, you're going to be second in command in all of the land of Egypt. But in chapters 42 through 50, we have the third major trial coming up. The trial of encounter. Encounter with his brothers, with his family. If you think that was easy, I don't think so. I think that was a severe trial. They hated him. They lied about him. They sold him into slavery. Now they were starving, they were famished, and guess who had the bread? Joseph. <laughs> so they make this little trek down into Egypt, where Joseph is second in command of all the land. He's got the food, but they don't know who's who in the zoo. They don't know that that's Joseph. All they know is, sir, we're hungry. Several episodes of that. Uh, this is a severe trial. Uh, a multiple trial, perhaps, with a wide range of human emotions. I mean, what was Joseph to do? Put yourself in his shoes. Sandals, I should say. How would he respond to their plight and their past? What was his response? What would his response be? How would the brothers react to his revelation of who he was? I put down, nobody recognized the song, but I, I put down that they were probably not singing Memory So Sweet of You. I don't think they were singing that at this point. 
So one can only imagine this confrontation of Joseph with his brothers. And now we come to chapter 50, verse 20, the verse we began with. And I invite you to look at it again. This is the finale, the grand finale. You remember me, right? I'm Joseph, right? You remember me, right? You know what you did to me, right? As for you, you meant it for evil. But God, turn it around for good. I'd like to conclude with some applications, if I may. I would like to draw three applications from this text, the Joseph story. The first application, and these are important because we don't know what tests lie ahead for us this week, this year. If I were to tell you some of the things that happen, are happening in the world, and Pastor, he's been reading up on it, he knows. If he were to tell you, or I were to tell you, your hairs would raise on end. I'm not worried. Pastor's not worried. Rose is not worried. We know the Lord, and many of you do here tonight. And you know in whom your hope is anchored. And he will see you through. But the first application I receive from this text, God uses providential circumstances to guide us in life and through life. He uses circumstantial providences to guide us through this life. You know, so, sometimes I, 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 uh, Janet and I will be in the car with me. I'll get to a light, and I'm in a hurry to get somewhere. Uh, there's a light like that up in uh, Natrona Heights, up at the Heights, uh, uh, over by Sharap Ford, I think. And I sit there, and I sit there, and the thing is red, and the thing is red, and it won't move. Finally, I'll turn to Janet, and I'll say to her, the thing's broken. I want to make a left turn, go down the hill, down to Freeport. You know, you know where that's at, right? Most of you know where that's at. Right. And I sit there and the thing won't turn. An hour later, well, I'm exaggerating. Finally, the thing turns. I'm in a hurry to get somewhere. You know what I mean? I've got to get there. So I go down the bottom of the hill, Freeport, and there's construction. I finally end up going where I'm going to go. I'm a little bit late, probably a lot late because of all this stuff happening. You know what? I'm still on time because the meeting hasn't started. Here I was worried about getting there. Providential circumstances, right? God controls traffic in this universe. Every detail of it. He's in charge. That's the first lesson I glean. First application from this passage. It was no mistake, it didn't catch God by surprise, that Joseph was sold as a slave. And ended up how? 13 years later? Second in command. After Pharaoh, he was next in charge. It was no mistake. God is not caught by surprises. Matter of fact, he sovereignly rules in the affairs of men. He does all things according the, to his own will. Ephesians 1.11. Second application. God overrules evil, and in the end, he turns it to good. He overrules evil, and in the end, he turns it to good. Let's do Romans 8.28. And we know that all things, all things, all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. I remember when I was a, a younger lad being in the home and my mom had this bottle and she would chase me around that dinner table. And I tell you something, I didn't want what was in that bottle. Cod liver oil. And in those days, they didn't have it in pill form. 
no capsules, just down the hatch with a spoon. No wonder I ran from that putrid stuff. I hated it. If you like cod liver oil, there's something wrong with you. And don't try to pedal off a bottle on me. I don't want it. I think she did finally catch me and get it down my throat. I want to tell you something. That stuff, that putrid stuff, was really good for me. Did you know that? It really was good for me. In the end, it was good for me. And sometimes we have to swallow some bitter pills in life. We don't like it. I can tell you, I don't like pain. I don't like suffering, and neither do I like misery. I don't like any of those three. But in the end, there's glory up ahead. Third application I get from this passage. God won't forsake his own. He will never leave you or forsake you. Before I close, because you've got to see that Super Bowl ending, I shut my eyes and I'll just believe who wins wins, but that's, you know, that's also providential, I believe. And remember what I said to you. I predict somebody with the word new in it is going to win tonight. Romans 8.18, let's conclude with a couple passages. God won't forsake his own. Let's look at Romans 8.18. We just quoted 8.28. But look at 8.18. <clears throat> Paul writes, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this life, of this time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed into us. It's going to be infused into us. The glory. Not our glory, Christ's glory. The sufferings of this life. Some of you perhaps are old enough to remember, I came from the old country and we had these scales. Balance scales. You remember that? You can still probably get them in an antique store somewhere in Lancaster or somewhere. You might find these old scales. And you put weights on one and you tried to balance your product with the weights. So when they were even like this, you knew you had the right amount. But the way this verse is worded is, here's one and here's the other. The trials of this life are not worthy to be compared with what's coming. And it's short-lived for now. Uh, if you'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, this is the last verse that I'd like to share with you. And then I'd like to draw a final conclusion, a final sentence or two. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I like this passage. And the whole paragraph, the whole paragraph I've entitled, Down but not out. That's a good one, isn't it? Down but not out. Chapter 4, look at verse 17. Well, uh, how about if we pick up with 16? 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. We don't give up. We don't get discouraged. Now, I tell you, sometimes I get discouraged. Sometimes I get down. But the Lord picks me up another day or two later, and I'm ready to roll again. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction. Hey Lord, you're clobbering me. You're knocking the daylights out of me. This is light affliction? Yeah, it's light. You're kidding. No, I'm not kidding. This is light affliction. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When you were in grammar class, now some of you don't remember that far back, they had in English grammar, they had a word that they called a superlative. Do you remember that? Of course you don't. A superlative was when you built on 
the foundation, you build up and you build up and you build up and you intensify the meaning. Look, this is exactly what, what we have here. It's working for us a far more exceeding up and eternal weight of glory. That's exactly what you have here. Did you see that? Verse 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For those that love God, there's something coming up ahead that's going to be permanent and eternal, and it's going to be worth it. It's going to be worth it. Worth it. Some of you have been faithful believers over the years. You don't have much to show for, perhaps. You think, oh, I'm just an average or don't have much to show for. God rewards faithfulness. Not how many people you had in your congregation, not how many books you've read or written, not how many positions you've had. He takes somebody like you and me, nobodies, and he makes something out of us. And we're privileged to faithfully serve him. Pastor's been, I, I've been giving him tracts, you know, and he never says anything to me because I know what happens to them. Next time I see pastor, tracts are gone. Some of you folks, you know what you've been doing? You've been giving out tracts. God will reward your faithfulness. He will. You don't think you're doing a lot. God may think otherwise. I'd like to conclude now with one statement. I would like to uh, uh, quote from a, a writer of bygone years. He lived between 1828 and 1917. He, he was a pastor in Africa, uh, a Dutch reform minister in South Africa. Uh, his name, and some of you may know his name, is Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray. I want to share with you what he said, okay? Because this will encourage you. He said, I'm here, I'm here, by God's appointment, in his keeping, under his training, and for his time. Let me do that one more time, then we'll close. I am here, Andrew Murray wrote, by God's appointment. Joseph was there by God's appointment. In his keeping, did Joseph die in prison? No, because I read he became second in command in the land of Egypt. Under his training, God was preparing him these 13 years. And folks, by the way, for you it may be less than 13 years, and it may be more than 13 years. I don't know how long God has in store for you. But it's under his training, and finally, for his time. When God's time is ripe, he will accomplish his glory and your blessing. I try to imagine what it's like to be second in command in the land of Egypt. Not nowadays, I don't want to be there. I don't think you would either. <laughs> I would have a brotherhood there that wouldn't like me too well. But I want to tell you something. In those days, God did something wonderful for Joseph. With all his flaws and everything else, God blessed him. My prayer for all of you, God will bless you. Lord, we thank you so much for this portion of Scripture. As we begin this year, we don't know what the trials are going to be. We just trust you to see us through. And thank you that you're coming back for us soon. In the meantime, we pray you'll find us faithful to you. Thank you for what you'll do in us, through us. You've left us here for a reason. Work out your divine purposes in our lives, we ask, for Jesus' sake. 
Amen. Yeah. Yeah.